The 1990s saw a drastic change in clinical practice and training in vascular surgery after Dr. J.C. Perotti reported success in treatment of aortic aneurysm by endovascular graft. The technique is now 20 years old. Dr. Perotti recalled the beginnings of the technique in a recent interview with Dr. Melina Kibbe. That was in 1976. I was doing cases with Al Humphreys. And one day we had two consecutive aortic cases, uh, an aortic aneurysms. And I made the observation that the femoral arteries were pretty big. And at the same time, I was having my training using the Seldinger technique to do selective uh, visceral arteriograms. So I joined the two ideas, big, uh, big arteries and uh, retrograde approach. And I thought perhaps we could compress the graft, use a very fine graft, compress it, and mount it over a metal cage and deploy that in a retrograde fashion from the femoral artery. And, uh, and when we reached the neck of the aneurysm, we could open that up and fix it with barbs or with the friction of the metal and, and replace, the, endogra replace the, the open procedure with this endo endolumina treatment. And what was the material that you used for that very first uh, idea that you envisioned for we the stent? We used uh, uh, elastic stainless steel, like a wire. And uh, I couldn't find a Dacron, a thin Dacron graft, so I used nylon, which was uh, obviously uh, had a lower profile. Uh, knowing that nylon was not a good, uh, uh, good material, but that was the thinner uh, fabric I could get and I used the nylon and I was not very successful because the profile was still big and the system was rigid, was rigid. and uh, so I was not successful uh, getting from the femoral artery up so I went to the, from the iliacs and I was able to place that into the aorta and at that time I, I wrote a protocol saying that I was foreseeing a day in which a patient was coming, walking into the operating room. We were doing the case percutaneously, and uh, we were covering the entry with a band-aid, and the patient was leaving the room walking. I wrote that in 1976. So it was a big thought for that time, but uh, I was convinced that that was feasible. Dr. Wesley Moore explains how the term endovascular surgery came about. Tell us how you coined the phrase endovascular surgery, which I'm sure not many people realize that, that this was your, uh, your coinage. Thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, that's um, truth. In the late 1980s, uh, interventional radiology was, uh, was becoming very strong in terms of doing uh, what was then called intravascular therapy. Right. And so they were doing balloon angioplasties on iliac lesions, and it became very apparent that a lot of the cases that we would be doing traditional surgery on would be going in that direction. And uh, it occurred to me, along with a number of other colleagues, that if we did not become involved in this new technology, uh, we were going to... <laughs> Uh, be left behind. Right. And so um, we put together a course, I believe it was in 1989, designed to give surgeons hands-on experience with catheters, guide wires, balloons, stents, and so forth. And I wanted to make the point that uh, doing these procedures inside the artery was just another form of surgery. Okay. Instead of operating outside the arteries, we're just operating inside. So we're trying to figure out how to make that point. And so we said, let's, let's call it endovascular surgery because it's, it's just surgery within the arteries. So um, together with Sam on, we put together the first course on endovascular surgery. Something that will surprise you and uh, will bring a, 
a smile to your face is that probably one of the main people really that has something to do with uh, one success and also to our friendship was John Bergen. Uh, John uh, was invited to a meeting that Louis Corral, another graduate from your program here in Northwestern, used to have a meeting right before the SVS in Miami for the Hispanic speaking people. Yeah. And it was a vascular meeting and he would invite surgeons to talk about vascular surgery. And John Bergen speaks Spanish. And John Bergen speaks Spanish. But yeah. his talk, he, he was giving, everybody gave their, their, their lectures in English, but they had simultaneous translation. Yeah. Anyway, John, uh, Juan was there, John was there, and we had the meeting and the, the second night of the meeting uh, Louis gave, Louis Corral gave a dinner at the Versailles, a well-known Cuban restaurant in Calle Ocho in Miami. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting and John Bergen was sitting to my left and Juan Perotti was sitting right in front. And Ramon Berger was right at the end of the table. So Juan tells me in Spanish, he said, you won't believe it. I sent an abstract to the SVS, to this SVS that's coming up yeah. on my first eight cases and they turned it down. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, you got to be kidding me. He said, no. So I turned over to, to, to John Bergen and I said, John, listen to this story about Juan. Mm -hmm. And John said, no, 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 that can't be. He said, you got to publish that now. Mm -hmm. And we both looked at Ramon Berger, who was at the end of the table, and we, we waved them over and I mm -hmm. said, you know, you got to listen to this story. And Ramon said, no, no, you got to send that right away to my journal. And he was published in the Annals of Vascular Surgery, <laughs> you know, in 91. And so we went to present this to our colleagues. There was a vascular surgery biology club. And I brought Perotti and Marin, and I gave the presentation. I guess Jerry Goldstone was running the thing, and he said, we already have a presentation. Jack Cronenwet is giving an hour's talk on uh, co-culturing smooth muscle cells and, and uh, endothelial cells. So you can wait until next year. And I said, Jerry, this is important stuff. Everybody ought to know about it because it's going to change the way you do stuff. And he says, oh, the hell with it. We'll give you 10 minutes. I'm just the secretary. You do what you want because I kept persisting. So I got 10 minutes to present this at the Basket of Surgery Biology Club with all the then leaders at the time. And I thought I was going to be greeted like a hero, you know. We had 25 cases. I had Perotti sitting in the audience, Marin sitting in the audience. We couldn't, three of us, be lying. So we presented these 25 or 30 cases. And nobody in the audience believed us. Chris Ahrens didn't believe us. Wes Moore didn't believe us. Jimmy Yao didn't believe us. Um, Jim Stanley, my good friend, didn't believe us. Um, I don't think Bob Rutherford, nobody believed us. And, and certainly John Porter was very derogatory. <laughs> and he said, imagine. you're lying. I can't and imagine he says, that. if you're not lying, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. So I got very depressed, and um, we went out, we had a beer, the three of us, and, and Perotti says, that's exactly how I was treated in Argentina. And uh, so we, ca and, and we sent a paper into the SVS. It didn't even make the cut. They, they rejected it, you know, in the, the dregs. Um, and, and so um, we kept at it, and obviously it kept working. And then I gave a presidential address at the Eastern Vascular in 1994, and I made that the topic of the address. And I said, if you guys don't learn this stuff, you're, gonna, you're out of business. And then two years later, I, was, I gave my presidential address at the SVS on Charles Darwin and vascular surgery, right. and I had three points. One was, if you don't become endovascular competent, you're, you're going to become extinct. Secondly, um, we had to become an independent specialty because this would define us and separate us from cardiac and general surgery. And thirdly, we had to form centers with the interventional radiologists so that we could learn from them and support them. And tongue in cheek, I was concerned that it would, would give us protection as vascular surgeons against cardiologists who were then becoming more active in this area. Dr. John Bergen wrote the commentary at the time of the article's first publication. Describing the reluctance to embrace the new procedure, Bergen wrote, In vascular surgery, no change for the better has occurred that wise and good men have not opposed. Wes, you were one of the early pioneers with EVT for a stent graft. 
uh, the, in fact, the first EVT implant in 1993. How did you get involved in therapy for aneurysms with uh, a stent graft? Again, it's who your friends are and, and networking. Um, at that time, 1986, um, Harrison Lazarus, mm -hmm. who was a general surgeon in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, called me on the telephone along with several other people and said he had a new way of treating aneurysms and would I be interested in joining an advisory panel to help him develop the technology. So a group of us met at the time of the American College of Surgeons meeting in Atlanta and uh, none of us had any idea what he was doing but it, you know, it was fun to get together with a group of colleagues. So we sat down around the table. We all signed our non-disclosure agreements. Harrison had already, had already patented this, and I forget the exact date of this. And he brings out this thing that looks like a fishing pole. And he says, this is how I'm going to fix aneurysms. And I said, Harrison, you've really lost it. How are you going to do that? And uh, so he then showed that at that time it was not over the wire. It was, he had, he had, a, he had sort of a, a floppy guide wire at the end of this delivery system. And so what you had to do was to stick it into the artery and let this floppy wire find its way up the iliac artery into the aorta. And the graft that was available was a, uh, was a tube graft. So the only aneurysms that were able to fix um, were those that had both a proximal and a distal neck. Right. Jimmy Yell coined the term uh, an apple on a string. And that's what we were <laughs> treating, apples on a string. And um, so uh, it was rather cumbersome to get this into position. You then pulled the sleeve back and the graft deployed. One of the things that we started to do was to utilize a uh, sheath that was unique for this. We could put the sheath into position over a wire. So we, indir <clears throat> we indirectly made it an over the wire system, got the sheath in place, then passed the device immediately below the renal arteries, pulled the sheath back, and then pulled the sleeve back. And so February uh, 1993, we put the first device in. And then they ultimately d uh, developed a unibody bifurcation graft. And we had the opportunity to put the first of those in. That was September 1994. And uh, that uh, both of those, I'm still following patients that I've put both of those in over time. In partnership with device manufacturers, many surgeons began developing a new generation of endovascular grafts. The introduction of catheter-based endovascular technology has become so prevalent that it has been used in 69% of OR cases from the 1990s to the present. Because of the growing need for endovascular surgical skills, the Society extended the vascular fellowship training to two years. For fellows who choose the 05 integrated program, a general surgery certificate is no longer required. The pursuit of an independent American Board of Vascular Surgery with complete separation from the American Board of Surgery has been a contentious issue for the SVS. It is, however, an important chapter in our society's history. The leaders of this movement, begun in 1993, were Frank Veith, James Stanley, Ramon Berger, and Robert Hobson, who were involved firsthand in the process. Tell us a little bit about the history of the independent board and how the beginning of that transpired as you were ascending the leadership ranks in vascular surgery. One of the nice things about being involved with the vascular societies is that uh, you do meet all these different people and whether you're on the program committee or whether you're on local arrangements or whether you're on this committee or that, you start to be to know all these different people. And at, the, and at the time of where there was this 
fomenting about whether we should be se separate. Let's give full credit to Drs. Vith and Stanley. When I came onto the uh, American Board of Surgery, I was uh, told that uh, you were going to be uh, like the child of divorcing parents. Um, at that time, vascular surgery and the vascular societies were making a push for an independent board to break away from the American Board of Surgery. But they still had to have a representative uh, from the vascular societies on the American Board of Surgery. And I was that representative. So I was going to the board from the vascular societies who were trying to <laughs> secede from the American Board of Surgery. So you were elected from the SVS Correct. as the representative from exactly. the SVS. Exactly. So it, it, it was a difficult time because once I got to the board, um, uh, this was a thorny time for the board also. Uh, they did not want vascular surgery to break away from the American Board of Surgery. Um, they wanted to keep the corpus of surgery intact as much as they could. Um, and they made a number of concessions. And I saw this as a window of opportunity for those of us on the board who were vascular surgeons to uh, begin the creation of a board within a board. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what evolved. And a lot of credit, and I'm not sure people know this, but a lot of credit goes to uh, Richard Dean, Dick Dean. Dick was on the American Board of Surgery at the time. He was actually a representative from, I think, the Southeastern Surgical Society or one of the, one of the other surgical societies. And he, the board was grappling with this, uh, this idea of um, what to do with vascular surgery, because vascular surgery wanted to leave the American Board of Surgery. And Dick and Wally Ritchie, who was the executive director at the time, came up with this concept, well, why don't we try to create a group within the American Board of Surgery that actually looks at the training and certification of vascular surgeons only? And out of that came the vascular surgery subboard, so to speak. Um, and that eventually evolved in the vascular surgery board of the American Board of Surgery. So I saw this as a window of opportunity that we could make great strides for American vascular surgery within the construct of the American Board of Surgery by having a separate board within the American Board of Surgery. And, and what it's evolved to is the vascular surgery board has absolute control of everything related to training and certification of vascular surgeons, and, um, and, and, and that's been a wonderful thing. I mean, it's got us the independent program, uh, the 05 construct of training. Uh, we can have any construct we want, uh, basically. And for a time, we had the 5 plus 2, the 3 plus 3, the 05. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we had a number of training constructs, and it all evolved from this group within the American Board of Surgery that uh, controls our, our training and certification. Is it a model that will work for other, sub, other specialties? I think so, and I think the American Board of Surgery is moving towards that. I don't know what's current with them now, but I know that uh, surgery on, uh, surgical oncology is moving in that direction. I think uh, trauma and acute care surgery is also moving uh, in that direction to be a separate group within the American Board of Surgery. Now the other thing that uh, was a real highlight in my opinion, and I think as many people recognize this, is your role on the American Board of Surgery. So you served as the director from 1993 to 1999, and during that time there was lots of discussions about the creation of a sub-board focused on vascular surgery, and I know that you were very much involved in that. Can you give us a little bit of insight on how that got started? Well, yes, there was a uh, about the time that I went on the board, I mean, almost simultaneously, there was this growing uh, <clears throat> sense of alienation on some parties' minds regarding the stature of vascular surgery in the minds of the world of surgery, the uh, degree to which uh, uninformed people were uh, supposedly at least constraining vascular surgery in its directions and dictating to vascular surgery what it could and could not do. Uh, the, uh, there was complaints that the American Board of Surgery and the RRC were uh, being uh, inappropriate in some of their uh, complaints about some of the vascular programs. Uh, I, I did not share that view. Uh, I mean, I, I thought that everybody was trying to do 
what they thought was right at the time. Mm -hmm. With that sort of uh, separatist uh, secession uh, uh, um, uh, emotion growing in some sectors of, of, of our field of vascular surgery, uh, it was about when I went on the board. And I think my first or second, second, maybe second year or third year on the board was when the issue was coming to a much greater a point of, of political and hostile uh, interactions. And we decided to hold, uh, our, the, the American Board of Surgery has a winter me meeting every year where it's a, a three or four day, I forgot, I mean, three days worth of, uh, of meeting that's somewhere in a retreat format. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided to devote uh, the retreat to a discussion of the issues surrounding vascular surgery and their interest in being independent of the American Board of Surgery. Being the only vascular surgeon on the board, I was asked to uh, give the views of what I saw was needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And it was basically uh, a, 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 a discussion of parenthood and of maturation of children mm -hmm. and its transference into organizational structures. Uh, and uh, I started by making the point that the reason that there are so many told them my pedigree that I had a deep commitment to maintaining the unity of surgery at Wake Forest with every discipline under one umbrella. And the way that what has happened at most places is that uh, uh, the, the chair, the chief, wants to have that position of power uh, uh, and, the, and, and the entire environment be dictated by his vision of how the structure should be coming to him instead of uh, understanding that each of those disciplines, that he didn't know jack about them, mm -hmm. and that there needs to be a separation between strategic oversight and, and, and tactical management of of things, and then I translated that over into uh, the the boards of of medicine. If you look at the American Board of Medicine, uh, it has all of these under it, of cardiology and blah blah blah. All of them are under the one. And I said, you know, we have the opportunity at this point, at, at each point in American Board of Surgery's past. Uh, the entity wanting to have its own, define its own destiny, uh, has been constrained to the point that they uh, bolted. And the American Board of Surgery insisted on maintaining it as a child uh, long beyond adolescence, and to the point <laughs> that they would then become divorced from their parenthood. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened with, and I went down each of the respective boards, orthopedic surgery, of uh, urology, of neurosurgery, all of these different specialties, finally said, you know, Jack, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And it was not because they weren't a mature specialty, it was because the American Board of Surgery did not broaden its umbrella mm -hmm. and take a a step up in the stature of what it's supposed to represent to an overarching board in which all of the intramural management of that discipline uh, were delegated to the sub-board. Uh, and, and b believe me, vascular surgery is not going to be the last one. That was my point at the end. I listed off the others. The oncology surgeons are going to want that. Pediatric surgeons basically already have that because they're under the umbrella, but oncology was, trauma would, the GI, I mean, all of these have the opportunities at points to be maturing in, in it. We have this one last opportunity to come up with a structure that will assimilate the opportunities for all of these respective disciplines to mature and become adults while still uh, having uh, a family. Uh, mm -hmm. under one umbrella when it comes to strategic uh, issues uh, re relating to the discipline of surgery. Bill Baker was there. He, uh, rep I think he was either the president or one of the officers at that time uh, of the societies. By the time the retreat was over, I think it was a pretty well uh, 
I don't know whether it was unanimous or not, but the vast majority of people there did have an appreciation that you couldn't stop people from growing up. Right. The issue is what's going to be the relationship of your children when they're adults. <laughs> and they all sort of, I think, bought into the idea of having a, a, the structure that we now have that's continued as well to be a, refined somewhat over the years since then. And I think the leadership of the American Board of Surgery uh, saw that their role really should be elevated beyond uh, details of uh, daily life in any of the special any of the disciplines that it oversees. I think that's a great analogy. That the parent-child-adolescent analogy is a really good one. Humans are humans. You continue to have the issue of how do you transition that phase of the life of the parent to the child that. Right. is going to go to become a parent and how much trauma <laughs> gets uh, occurs before the finality of adulthood uh, and its interactions between generations occurs. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I think, a tipping point for vascular surgery. It was uh, very divisive uh, outside our profession and within the vascular community. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate. Uh, I uh, can be quite candid about uh, some of the individuals that, that supported and were detractors of this idea. Uh, I mean, vascular surgery was conceived, you know, 75, 80 years ago, uh, and it actually was sort of born back in the early 70s uh, uh, when it became apparent that some people were taking really good care of patients and other people did not have the expertise based on the training probably to do some of the things that they were being asked to do in practice. And Jim DeWeese uh, was the first to sort of take a look at how we would train people. And it, he was involved with the American Heart Association at that time and put together a proposal for training uh, people to do vascular surgery. Cardiac surgery was already on its own way. Uh, and at that time uh, he did that the American Board of Surgery said, uh, we uh, do not uh, care to move on this. This is a turf issue. And it actually was probably a bigger turf issue between general surgeons doing vascular surgery and the cardiac surgeons who were doing vascular surgery than anybody else. Uh, and a few years later, uh, Jim DeWeese, along really with the leadership of Jack Wiley, uh, put together a, a uh, a guidelines for training, and they had this PEAK program, uh, Program Evaluation Endorsement uh, Committee. The American Board of Surgery really did not want to get involved with this at that time. And they started doing that, and that was back in the, the early 1980s. And uh, by 1984, it was clear that young people finishing general surgery who wanted to do vascular surgery were signing up for these uh, unofficially approved programs that had no ACGME, no residency review committee, or anything like that, but strictly done with J Jesse Thompson and Emmerich Zalagi uh, and Jim DeWeese and Jack Wiley, this group that really were very adamant on their own time and their own, own support to go out and look at programs and make suggestions. And at that point, the board said, we really ought to do something. Uh, so they went ahead and they, they said, uh, we, we agree we need to have training criteria. Uh, that was in 1984, 82. In 1982, they gave the first exam to 14 wonderful members of the directorship of the American Board of Surgery, which included two vascular surgeons. Uh, some trauma docs who kept saying, you're fragmenting general surgery, why in the world are we doing this? But they took the exam. They all passed, interestingly. Uh, and uh, two years later, uh, they got approval from the ABMS to have training programs approved by, with, with an RRC. Uh, and that, that really set the stage. They had a certificate of special qualifications. And that was, ended up being a bone of contention. Uh, they were very, very incensed, I think, that somebody thought they could do something better than the very good general surgeon who was well-trained. Uh, and so the certificate was smaller than the regular board certificate. I mean, it, it became very petty. 
And of course, whoever suggested that met with the same kind of pettiness from the vascular community who said, you guys are a bunch of idiots or something. You don't understand what we're trying to do. Uh, and that, that actually went on and on and on. And it was somewhat uh, foolish. Uh, because in order to sit for that exam, you had to do 100 vascular cases. You had to have some uh, documentation that you had taken part in a big educational program, uh, presented papers at a national meeting, and it became an elitist group. And for the, the, the majority of vascular surgeons who were not in an academic center, who were not presenting papers, uh, it was very offensive. And the occasional person that was doing 80 cases a year was then s struck with, if I want to maintain my hospital privileges in vascular, I've got to do a few more so I can be certified. And, and it, it, it was the wrong carrot to wave in front of people. Uh, and, and that was attributed to the vascular community. It wasn't the vascular community, it was members of the American Board of Surgery who did not want to let this group go too loose. Probably four or five years after that, the board decided they needed to have criteria for the number of cases a finishing general surgery resident would have in order to sit for an exam. And the only in the first cases that were identified were 44 arterial reconstructions, which may have been fine. Uh, and if you look at the number of cases done in the aggregate pool and then divided the number of trainees, that might have happened. But the problem was some programs like at Ann Arbor, we were, I think our finishing residents were doing 120 uh, arterial cases. There were some that weren't. And it was gonna be hard for many, many good programs to train their general surgeons with that criteria and have any cases left over uh, for any kind of a training fellowship. And it put about a quarter of the existing fellowships at Jeopardy, uh, only about a quarter had enough cases to really fly with it and the other 50% were sort of uh, in no man's land. They varied from year to year. Uh, and at that time, uh, Frank Beef gave his presidential address about the evolution of vascular surgery, saying we either change or we're not gonna exist, uh, and we need to separate ourselves. And uh, I, also at that time, the American Board of Surgery was having real conflict. Uh, uh, they supported the American Board of Plastic Surgery in a lawsuit to try to prevent otolaryngology from uh, getting a certificate of facial plastic surgery. Well, here we are trying to lower this requirement for general surgeons and we have no audience. And at that time, Bob Smith was president uh, of uh, the ISCVS and I was president of the SVS. And I said, Bob, I don't think we're gonna have an audience with the board and we should think about having more independence so we don't have to argue our point every time there's an issue. Uh, and uh, Bob agreed. And we then met, and it turned out that our chairman <coughs> of otolaryngology had been involved with this fray that I had never heard about. I doubt that very many people had. Uh, and I asked, his name was Chuck Krause, and I said, Chuck, I said, you know, this is what's happening to us. What do you suggest? And Chuck said, well, there are two attorneys in the country who know a lot about uh, educational issues related to medical graduate training and postgraduate training. And he said, I would suggest you speak to them. Uh, so uh, Bob Smith, who's uh, I think one of the most gentlemanly surgeons I've ever known, and I met uh, with Bill Maloney, who was the director of the Society of Vascular Surgery, the executive director at that time, met with Thomas Rhodes, who was one of these two attorneys uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. The other one was from Texas. And he said, well, you've got a long road to hoe if you think you're ever gonna have independence. It turns out he had represented otolaryngology and they were successful uh, in their approach uh, with this. It turns out that uh, 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 Tom Rhodes was a very good friend of the general counsel for the ABMS. And it was all politics, but it was very civil. So in, that was, the topic then of my presidential address in 1997, a year after Frank Vies. And at that time, I actually, we incorporated the board before I got there, there and there were uh, eight of us, uh, myself and Bob, who were sitting presidents, uh, Bill Abbott and Bill Baker, who were presidents-to-be, and Frank Vies and Jerry Goldstone, who had been presidents, and then Andy Whittemore uh, and John Town, who were secretaries. 
and we met in Chicago and we said, Tom Rose will incorporate our board, cost all of $125 in the state of Georgia. Uh, do we want to do it? And none of them knew that Bob and I had gone off in this path with Bill Maloney. And we met uh, again at O'Hare and to a person they said, we're way overdue. So we incorporated a board and that was in the early fall. We announced it at the Merritt College of Surgeons meeting to the program directors in general surgery. John Porter was the head of the program directors in vascular surgery. It talked to the, the director of the Merritt College of uh, Surgeons and it really created a big rumpus uh, at that point. Uh, for my presidential address, which was down the road, uh, we solicited opinions of everybody who had a certificate. 91% of people who were, had their certificate said, we want to do this. Uh, in 1997, in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, we had, uh, for better terms, a manifesto where we said we're declaring independence. It's the American Board of Vascular Surgery. Uh, it was signed by about 40 or 50 people. All the executive officers of the SVS, all the executive officers of the North American chapter, I said, all the officers, the program directors. And, and we said, you know, if the American Board of Surgery just needs to respect what we're trying to do, and we were working back from patient care. This had nothing to do with finances had nothing to do with ego. It had to do with training people uh, so they'd be competent vascular surgeons. And obviously that gets translated in to where you practice and what you can do at a hospital. And of course, the ABMS said, all we do is look at training criteria. We don't look at practice things as a hospital issue. Well, the reality is the yellow pages in a number of our major cities had lists of people that had their ABMS certificates in pediatrics or surgery or whatever which is where patient care enters into it. So they were talking sort of out of both sides of their mouths. Uh, and then the, the outcome of that was we spent the next four or five years trying to negotiate with the board to have independence. And we finally, when we weren't getting any place, 2002, Jack Croner went and Frank Veith and I went to the liaison committee. We, we petitioned that we have a board. Uh, and we did that on the 18th of December. Uh, a few days later, we got a note saying that, that our petition had been declined. Uh, on December 26th, the day after Christmas, we wrote a letter to them saying there are four or five criteria to establish a board. We'd like to know where we failed. And that we wrote back saying we did not uh, 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 discuss these individually. You failed on global issues. We then had six months to appeal that, which we did to the AMA, which was a parent supporter of the liaison committee. And they wrote back this wonderful letter saying, each issue was never voted on. There were no minutes taken at the meeting. Therefore, we can't uh, tell you the criteria which are now. Well, it was maddening. At that point, it was very clear that this was almost like a cartel. Uh, and we, we met many, many times about that. The, the, the subsequent thing that happened was the ABS realized nobody was going to go away. This was going to be a smoldering problem. And Richard Green, uh, to his great credit, uh, uh, negotiated with the American, he was the president of SVS, negotiated with the board then to have a zero and five certificate uh, separate from general surgery. And, and you know, it was so important to do that. At that time, 27% of people in general surgery training programs were women. That was our, that was the, the birthing ground from which we had fellows to do vascular surgery. You could never have more than 27% of people going to vascular surgery because that's that was the pool. Mm -hmm. uh, and vascular surgery at that time had 20%. It's very interesting. In this day and age, with the 05 program, over half the trainees are from women. You talk about a workforce pool that had never been allowed to become in their take part in their profession. So it was a means of, of dealing with some things that just weren't quite right. And I, you know, I think it's made a huge difference to our profession. And, and we were very fortunate to, to have it happen. You have a consultant at that time. What's the name of the consultant? We, we had a consultant that was, had been the executive director of the American Board of Emergency Medicine that was the last board to be certified. Uh, and ben Munger was his name. PhD, and he had just been given the Distinguished Service Award from the ABMS when we hired him. 
So he had credibility with the people who had rejected what we had wanted to do. Is that true that we have an office in Chicago? We, we had an office in Chicago. Uh, we had a lot of support for many people, but you know, as I say, it was quite divisive. Uh, and part of it was that the, some of the people within our own specialty felt very strongly that the most mature person was someone who had five years of general surgery and then had additional vascular training. Now, there's no question but what they're more mature. The problem was at that time, there were probably, out of the 70-some training programs, there were something like 15 or 16 that didn't fill. Kids were not gonna do this. Uh, uh, and you know, we needed, to, we needed to have a different path for people to be trained. There was a lot of pushback, but, but I think the society uh, and people really did, did well. Jack Chrono was very important at helping establish the Zero Five program, the integrated program. Well, I don't think we should consider that disapproval is a failure. I think what you have done, what the group have done, you know, we make the difference for us. Now we have the Zero Five program. We, we are doing all the things that are supposed to be done by vascular surgeon. So I think you guys have some positive impact on oh, that. Oh, I, yeah, I've, I've never had a second thought, Jimmy, about the, the value of what we did, and I've never had any regret. I do, I do think that we've become broad enough now that uh, to think even, you know, we're a little bit like otolaryngology might be, uh, or neurosurgery. We have, enough, we have enough expertise in little pockets of what we do. I think it's highly unlikely that anybody can do all of it. Anybody tells me that they know how to deal with complex arch reconstructions with an endograph and then can deal with some little child that's got two millimeter renal arteries, and by the way, they've got a bunch of vein uh, valves that need to be dealt with. I mean, the, the, the information is quite broad. We have enough specialists that it's someday, I, I just like, in otolaryngology, you'd be a neurotologist or a head and neck cancer person or a sleep medicine doc. I mean, there are a lot of things that I think vascular probably will morph into as time goes on. And I think patients will be the beneficiaries. My biggest failure was um, the inability to make vascular surgery succeed in attaining um, specialty status, real specialty status as an independent specialty rather than a subspecialty. What lessons did you learn from failure? Well, Tough to question. try something else. I mean, if something fails, first of all, you have to be very persistent. And uh, just to, to go back to the board situation, I was enormously persistent yes, and committed to it for many years, but when it failed and it was obvious to me that it wasn't going to succeed, probably for a, a lot of bad reasons, uh, I basically said to myself, you have to walk away and do something else. And uh, that's basically what I did. And so I think that failure is part of life, it's certainly part of yes. vascular surgery. Oh, yes. And uh, you can have a failure that by persistence you can uh, turn into a success but in the case with the, the board situation, it was, I thought, was hopeless. And, and so we turned our attention to other things. But you know, at this time of your life, you were also uh, president of the Society for Vascular right. Surgery with phenomenal demands on your time right. and your effort. And not only that, as we remember, this is when the uh, two societies, the ISCVS, North American chapter, <coughs> SVS, were uh, going together. And, right. uh, it, was ten, it was 10 years ago. When yes. I was telling Becky Marin last night at the dinner, I remember uh, we had, I think, six people in the room. Uh, it was Tom, myself, Jack, Greg, Pat. Um, I'm not sure if Jimmy was there or not. He may have, may have was in Chicago. We met Becky Marin. And it changed vascular surgery. Oh, but, it was, but it was also the time that we resolved the great battle. Yeah. yeah. It was the most important contribution, wasn't it, from yeah. that standpoint? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We resolved, we resolved yeah. the great battle, which, which tore yeah. vascular, it, it, yeah. as we know, yeah. it, it was wrenching. 
Yes. Um, yes. The the were when good friends stopped talking to each yeah. other. Oh, it was. You know, each of us it was thinking. Sad. It was sad. Yeah. What was best for vascular surgery yeah. and thinking that uh, we had the right the right position. So a lot was going on at that time, and uh, only because of the fortuity of of, of, of being there at the time. Um, I was the one that was dealing with Frank Lewis when we worked out the zero five. And Frank turned out, in my mind, to be a real honest broker right. and a friend of vascular surgery. And I think we took the right path. Yeah. Uh, we, well, he had been trained by Bill Blaisdell. Maybe that yeah. uh, added a little bit to it and yeah. helped a little bit. Uh, yeah. We know how important that uh, has been. In 2012, reflecting back, you must be very proud and pleased with the way the 2002, 2003, yeah. 4 era went. Right. If you just come to this meeting, yeah. you have right. to be proud. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you have to. Vascular surgery, the SVS, has become a great organization. Let me use your words to segue then into the American Board of Surgery. You've, uh, you've been very active. Uh, both uh, with the board and with uh, the vascular review, uh, how did how did you uh, uh, get through all of that in the midst of the controversy? Some of our brethren wanted to separate away from the board; others wanted to stay. And how did that all work out? An important bit of background for me is that I had been uh, asked to join the residency review committee for surgery, and. Um, and I accepted that position and, and I was on the RRC and of course at that time, I mean that was right around the time that these questions came up and I was one of the original signees of the declaration in the Journal of Vascular Surgery that we needed a separate board because at that time the American Board of Surgery was being quite intransigent about the question of whether vascular surgeons could be trained independently of general surgeons. From my perspective, it was always about training. Uh, I, I didn't really care, and I don't think any of us particularly care, what the name of the board is that's on our certificate. We just want to know how we can get there, and do we have to get there through general surgery? That was the question. And so, so for a long time, I was an advocate and met with, uh, I remember meeting with Jim Stanley, Frank Veith, and, and the American Board of Surgery, and I was there on the RRC advocating for the concept that we didn't need to have full general surgery training in order to become a vascular surgeon, that it was inefficient. And that in the long run, given the changing demographic of the applicants that we were seeing, we were, uh, it was not a sustainable model, and that we needed to be more efficient and more focused. And we couldn't just keep expanding training every time a new procedure came along, which is effectively what we did for endovascular procedures, and still think that these people needed to know how to do breast surgery. I mean, that was it in a nutshell. And, and uh, so th that, uh, you know, everyone had slightly different perspectives about that, and some people had more of a, a, a solution through a separate board and saw that as the best way forward. Other people, I think, believed that there were a lot of advantages of, in being part of a larger board because there are a lot of political decisions that get made at the Board of Medical Specialists, and most of them depend on, you know, how big your boat is. So there were many people who felt that it would be better if we could do this within the ABS structure. And, and so this argument raged and the ABS was not being very helpful during those early years. And then um, at, at some point, uh, Dick Green, it was in my, after I was president, Dick Green, who was, had just become president, and I met with uh, Frank Lewis and uh, Bob Rhodes, and we had a really good discussion about where this was going and the fact that you know, somebody was going to have to give a little bit. It became clear that they were more attached to keeping vascular surgery in the fold of the American Board of Surgery, just as they wish they had done with thoracic surgery, than they were whether you had to do general surgery first. And so the solution that we came to in that meeting was that they would issue a statement that they would support uh, a, at that time called sub-board that would be based on the concept that preliminary training in general surgery would not be a prerequisite. 
Now at the same time, I had been for years, going back to Bob Barnes <laughs> and your connection, and, um, and others uh, who had long advocated for early differentiation in surgical training, core surgery followed by specialty surgery. I had had many meetings with the uh, Association of Program Directors in Surgery. I'd been, at the time, I was the president of the Program Directors in Vascular Surgery and was on the RRC. So I had a lot, so I was involved in a lot of meetings and we tried, and we were coming up with curricula for training vascular surgeons, the best possible curriculum. And, uh, and we developed the five-year training program. And a lot of people said, well, you can't train a vascular surgeon in five years. And we said, well, you can train a general surgeon in five years, can't you? Said, yes, and well, isn't that a broader knowledge-based discipline than vascular surgery, which is quite focused? Yes. And it just took many of the more senior people in general surgery a while to sort of, for the light to go on. Say, oh yeah, gee, I guess if I thought of it that way, maybe you could train a vascular surgeon in five years. And once the uh, American Board of Surgery agreed and saw that concept, then it became much simpler. Then it became just a pragmatic approach. What's the easiest way to get this done? And the easiest way was to form a vascular surgery board within the ABS rather than the tumultuous battle to have it be separate because at the end we accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. You have been very much front and center in the relationship with the American Board of Surgery and vascular surgery. Um, do you want to say a few words about that? Well, I think it's, it's an interesting saga, and I think if you step back a few steps, you can see that uh, I think the times have dictated what has happened. It's kind of like Toynbee used to say, does history make man make history or history make man? And I think basically from the time that Jack Wiley and Jesse Thompson and Ed Garrett started with the certificate of special and added qualification in vascular surgery to the current time where there is an independent uh, vascular surgery board under the aegis, obviously, of the American Board of Surgery, a lot of things happen to make that easy. Uh, first of all, our big concern when we started general uh, vascular surgery was dealing with general surgery, and general surgeons felt they were vascular surgeons. Certainly by the time I was on the American Board of Surgery, no one had that concept anymore. I mean, in fact, vascular, uh, general surgery took a lot of the ideas and strategies that vascular had and applied them to, you know, pancreatic biliary and, you know, ICU's mm -hmm. type certificates and mm -hmm. what have you. And the pediatric uh, surgery board also did, followed uh, our outline. And the thing is that what seems to emerge that the competition or concern we have with general surgery is not. It's a niche. Then it was an interventional radiologist, and increasingly, from what my colleagues tell me, is the interventional cardiologist, as the interventional radiologists aren't as, though doesn't seem to be as strong a player in this as they mm -hmm. had been. And so, and then it makes it very easy. There's, there's now no disagreement or conflict between vascular surgery and what we would traditionally call general surgery. And so, uh, we have, uh, the certificate that we have, you know, and when you looked at the variety of approaches to solving this problem, we were all a lot closer than I think a lot of people realized. Well, I think the American Board of Vascular Surgery was, um, was a bold step. Uh, you know, at that time uh, in the leadership group, there were, there were lots of areas of discontent with the current political situation involving the American Board of Surgery and relationship with vascular surgery as an entity with the American Board of Surgery. And I think everybody probably would have agreed on our side that we had no control and very little input into, uh, for example, the vascular qualifying examinations, uh, the vascular certificates, uh, the vascular training programs. And, and there was this sense that everything was being dictated by the ABS, which was largely general surgeon 
uh, controlled. And so um, we had many meetings at the time I think, with Wally Ritchie, who was the director of the ABS, and some other people, and tried to negotiate certain changes, and, and essentially not much was happening. And, and what Wally kept saying is that, well, the directors said no, or the directors don't want to do this. Um, and finally, one day, uh, the idea was hatched that maybe we ought to form, just form an independent board. And so at a meeting of Eight, eight of us, and I don't remember exactly, it was the presidents, past presidents, I think secretaries and past secretaries of the then two societies. We met at the American Airlines Club in Chicago at O'Hare International Airport and, and agreed to incorporate the American Board of Vascular Surgery. That was in, in mid-September, and we also agreed that we would say nothing about it to anybody until the American College of Surgeons meeting that was going to be held in October in San Francisco. And the reason was they wanted to, to notify the appropriate, you know, high level people in the board and the college uh, that this was going to happen, so they didn't read about it in the newspaper. And as you know, it turned out to be a very contentious and divisive event for our specialty. There were uh, many people in the organization that felt very strongly that we should separate from the American Board of Surgery. And there were, I suppose, an equal number of people who felt strongly that we should work within the American Board of Surgery. Even though there were two large surveys of the membership, uh, and I think 75% said we should form an independent board. But unfortunately, uh, it got politicized, and I think... Um, really damaged a lot of friendships and a lot of the collegiality for which I think vascular surgery was known. I mean, we used to have, you know, wonderful meetings and wonderful relationships and everybody got along and it really created some very, very unfriendly situations. Ultimately, after the application for the board failed at the, um, uh, I guess there's some coordinating committee from the AMA and and the uh, specialty societies, and the appeal was turned down. I think the, it gradually uh, faded away, but during the process of those years, uh, I think that most of the things that we thought were important to us, and at one time there was a 14-point memorandum. These are right. the things that we think that as an independent board we should have. I think we got all of them except the one thing, which was the independent board. Yeah, true. And, and even... Further to that, I, I think give credit to the American Board of Surgery. I think they have gone a long way to giving us functional independence. I mean, we're not strictly independent, but there's an American Board of Vascular or a Board of Vascular Surgery within the ABS that essentially makes up the exam, determines the pass rate, sort of decides on all matters of vascular surgery. And now with this score program, you know, the 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 curriculum for surgery in general, it's defined vascular surgery in very simple terms relative to what the general surgery residents are expected to learn. So I think we really have all that, all that we really need as an independent board, uh, but without necessarily being independent. And in fact, there were some situations in which I think the, the power and the size of the ABS were very helpful to us. Uh, for example, when the American, um, uh, the cardiology board uh, tried to, uh, s to put into their training curriculum uh, peripheral vascular interventions, uh, it was through uh, the board that helped write a very strong letter of opposition to the, um, the uh, American Board of Medical Specialties saying they want to put this in their training requirements. They don't have an educational program for it. And it, and it was initially turned down. So... I, I'm not sure we would have been able to do that on our own. True. Yeah, true. Uh, I, I, think, I think what we did was very, turned out to be very important. Uh, I feel badly that it created so much animosity, and some of which still exists among certain individuals. But I think it's, it's largely a thing of the past. I think vascular surgery came out stronger for it. 
I think the American Board of Surgery is stronger for it. I think, um, uh, I think both sides actually won. In the first decade of the new millennium, the SVS began to engage in political action with government agencies. A political action committee was formed in 2002 under the leadership of Drs. Hugh Trout, Tom Riles, and Robert Zvolak, led by AAVS President Dr. William Pierce. So reimbursement is uh, very interesting right now. We were enormously successful in the world of these relative value units uh, pulling SVS and vascular surgery up by the bootstraps from, from the mid-90s, which is sort of when my story began, uh, up to the recent past. We've worked with this relative value committee. We are frequent visitors to HICFA and now CMS. And, and we've also learned to be political. And, and we go to Congress for the things we need to go to Congress on. And, and so we have been successful. It's a defensive position now, but I think we're at this point working from a, a relatively good and solid position where we're not at the bottom of the pile and we've gained a reputation for transparency. We've gained a reputation for honesty. And so when we go to these to these various sites where they make these determinations for, for reimbursement, they know that the information we bring is, is going to be straightforward and candid and with, with no hidden agendas or, or, or no synthesized data. Dr. Carlo Dal Olmo was the long-serving chair of the committee from 2008 to 2012. The committee crafted a mission statement that advocated for greater choices for vascular disease patients and an increased awareness of vascular surgeon specialists among health care planners. The PAC prompted Congress to pass legislation for screening of abdominal aneurysms, among other health care issues. The committee also focuses on the issue of Medicare reimbursement and has raised $100,000 annually to support political campaigns. This is the current slate of members of the SVS PAC. In recent years, a number of vascular surgeons have moved to leadership positions as dean, president, or CEO within their own institutions. Dr. Larry Ollier became a dean, president, and CEO of a hospital and recently chancellor of LSU. Dr. Ollier told us that the key element for success in these leading positions is respect and empowerment. And I don't think that any one individual necessarily knows how to manage all the nuances of a hospital. Um, I had a very good administrator who worked with me in Scotland, Victor Yick. And um, Victor was very methodical. And we built relationships. And we, there was a, there were a group of vice presidents at Mount Sinai in the different areas of the hospital. Um, you know, supply chain management had an individual, human resources another, nursing was another. And we, we div when we got into this financial issue and I wound up being appointed president, Victor and I worked very closely with the vice presidents that had each of these divisions. And we empowered each of them to do what they needed to do to improve things. And I think empowering people who are responsible and responsible for their areas. They know that better than I could ever know it. And so they took this on and what we said, I trust that you will do it. The only thing you need to tell me is if you're having a problem that I can help you with and I will come in and get in. But otherwise, here's where we want to go. Here's the vision of what we're going to do. You do it and just let me know when you have any obstacles and I'll take care of it. So empowering them to go out and do this made a big difference. The evolution of vascular surgery began in 1946 with the establishment of the Society for Vascular Surgery followed in 1951 with the founding of the International Society of Angiology. In 2001, the ISCVS changed its name to the American Association for Vascular Surgery and in 2003, SVS and AAVS united behind the efforts of Dr. Thomas Riles and Jack Cronenwet.
You know, we weren't 100% sure until the vote of the membership, and, and Tom and I talked about it and decided that we really had to put out all the facts and make sure everybody understood what we thought were compelling reasons to do this. And so we, we, we fl didn't flip a coin, but because my talk was right before the vote, I, I was the one who was going to give it, and that's why my address was about that. And as uh, it happened, it was overwhelmingly adopted. And looking back on it, I think both Tom and I feel that it was probably the, the most important thing we could contribute by helping shepherd this through. Because if you look at SVS now, and what a, what a remarkable business it has become and how it's been able to advocate extraordinarily well uh, in Washington for vascular surgery, how it's involved many more volunteers and all of its committees and infrastructure, and how well this office has worked and how well it's done financially. Those were all the things that we had hoped for uh, or dreamed about. And I think, um, you know, sort of looking back, it's, it's, it's been amazing. I think it's, it's helped in so many ways. <clears throat> Because uh, once you got rid of the conflict uh, and everybody could focus all of their energies on the real problems uh, that whether it was international or political action or fundraising or, or career development, I mean some of the programs that have come about to uh, help us embrace endovascular surgery really were sponsored by the societies as you recall. So, so many good things have come out of it. With the coming together of SVS and AAVS, united we stand. With the merger, the SVS has an organizational structure consisting of a board of directors, an executive committee and four consuls, research, education, fellowships, and clinical practice. The SVS continues to reach out to members across the globe with international scholar programs and chapters in many countries. The official newspaper of the SVS, Vascular Specialist, was recently launched. SVS members serve wounded soldiers through the Visiting Vascular Surgeon Program at Walter Reed Hospital and Landstuhl Regional Medical Center. Participation in our annual meeting continues to grow. Our quality and performance initiatives reflect our commitment to our mission statement. The SVS continues to explore various modes of electronic outreach, including this program, as well as the ongoing history series documenting pioneers of the specialty. The history series is produced by the History Project Work Group and sponsored by the Society for Vascular Surgery. Thank you for watching.